Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event for Hot Stew with Fiona Mosley and Steph Cha. I'm hoping I'm saying both of those names right. Um, we are so excited to share this book with you and hear from both Fiona, Fiona, oh my God, Fiona and her conversation partner, Steph. Um, I'm Laura. I'm the event coordinator here at the Astoria Bookshop, which is the bookshop hosting this event. If you don't know who we are because you found us through the internet or you're a friend of the author or the guest, we are a general interest bookstore in Astoria, Queens. Um, and before we get started, I just want to go, go over like our code of conduct and a few housekeeping things. Um, you'll have opportunities to ask questions throughout the whole uh, discussion. Um, you can press ask a question down there and you can vote on other people's questions if there's something you'd like answered. Um, but we will not get to those until the last 10 or so minutes. So I'll pop back in at 1150. Um, other than that, you can chat with each other on the right or leave nice messages. Um, don't say anything you wouldn't want your mom or boss to see. That is my rule of thumb. And other than that, yeah, just keep it respectful. And most importantly, Go ahead and get your copy of Hot Stew. There is a button at the bottom where you can go to our website and get your copy. And we still have some, I think we still have some signed book plates. Um, but if you're really concerned about that, I would recommend calling the store just to double check. Um, and yeah, other than that, I'm really excited to have you guys here and uh, have fun, enjoy. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here with Fiona. Um, I've read both of your books. Um, I think they're really ripping, fantastic. Um, and um, yeah, and I think uh, we're going to start um, by uh, having Fiona read um, a little bit from Hot Stew, which just came out in paperback, at least in the US. I don't know what the UK publication schedule is. But, um, you know, it's this beautiful book right here. I mean, I have the hardcover, but. Uh, um oh yeah it looks good yeah it's great <laughs> um, so let's hear a little bit from this book and then uh and then we'll chat okay thanks very much steph um and thank you to astoria bookshop for hosting me um my goodness i wish i could be there in person uh trip to new york right now sounds absolutely dreamy but unfortunately i'm uh i'm still here in uh, scotland um but i'm going to read from the beginning of hot stew which has just come out in paperback in the u.s um so yeah just setting the scene um in central london um in a district called soho um that's where we kick off on the corner of the street there is an old french restaurant with red and white checkered tablecloths De sable has been there for decades and has changed very little in that time it has served the same dishes with ingredients sourced from the same suppliers and wines from the same vineyards. The bottles are stacked on the same shelves and when they are pulled out and dusted off, the silky liquid is poured into the same set of glasses or ones of a similar style, bought sporadically to replace those that have smashed. The plates are the same, small, round, porcelain. When the weather is good, tables are placed outside there is a space between the public thoroughfare and the exterior wall, and the tables are set tightly, with two chairs tucked beneath. One of the tables wobbles. Over the years, thousands of napkins have been folded and placed under the offending leg. Hundreds of customers have complained and moved to alternatives, and thousands more have quietly put up with the inconvenience. They have spilled glasses of wine, grumbled, and considered asking to move, before deciding against it. The restaurant serves escargot. The restaurant has served escargot since it opened. Hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of snails. They have been thrown into boiling water and their carcasses scooped out and served with garlic butter. The chewy pellets have been picked with forks and fingers and the curled shells discarded. It is lunchtime in midsummer. A box of snails has been taken from the fridge and placed on the side its contents ready to be immersed and scalded. It is left unsupervised as chefs bustle around the kitchen with sharp knives, pots and pans, bunches of parsley and stalks of celery. A single snail on the small side 
wakes from its chilly slumber and climbs over the edge of the box, down the side and onto the stainless steel counter. Slowly, it descends to the floor, then to the back of the kitchen, where there is a door to the street. After about 20 minutes, the little snail finds itself in the alley behind the restaurant, feasting on the discarded outer leaves of a Savoy cabbage. Once sated, it continues its journey. It begins to climb the wall, flexing and releasing. The building stands in Soho, in the middle of London. The foundations were constructed in the 17th century during the interregnum, and in the space between a father and a son, the ampersand between the king is dead and long live the king. Bricks and plaster overlaid onto now crooked timber frame. There are wormholes in the timber and snail licks on the bricks. The district was once a suburb. London was enclosed by a wall and to the north there was a moor. There were deer and boar and hare. Northwest of London, northeast of Westminster, men and women ga galloped out from the two cities to hunt and their cries gave this place its name. So, ho, so, ho. The stone came. Bricks and mortar replaced trees. People replaced deer. Sticky grey grime replaced sticky brown dirt. Paths carved by the tread of animals were set in stone, widened, edged with walls and gates. Mansions were built for high society. There was dancing, gambling, sex. Music was played and plays were staged. Bargains were struck, sedition was plotted. Betrayals were planned, secrets were kept. New people arrived. Emigres from France came to escape revolution, guillotine, war. Mansions were divided and subdivided. Drawing rooms became workshops, parlours became coffee shops. Whole families lived in single rooms and disease spread. Syphilis erupted in sores on the skin and delusions in the mind. Cholera hid in the water, crept through the drains, came out of pumps and down human throats. Books were written, ripped up, rewritten. Karl Marx dreamed of utopia while his wife cooked dinner and scrubbed the floor. His friends met on Great Windmill Street, where wind was once the means of production. When the bombs fell on London, Soho took a few. Dark lesions appeared in the lines of Georgian townhouses and people sheltered beneath ground. After the war, the concrete came and parallel lines and precise angles that connected earth to sky. Houses were rebuilt, shops were rebuilt, and new paving stones were laid. The dead were buried, the past was buried. There were new kinds of men and new kinds of women. There was art and music and miniskirts and sharp haircuts to match the skyline. Films were made, records were cut. Soho came to be filled with the apparatus of sound and vision. Electric currents ran through cables and magnets and copper coils and pushed rhythmic air into dark rooms where people danced in new ways and drank and smoked and ingested new drugs imported from old places. And they spoke again of revolution. And they spoke until the winds changed. Trade and commerce and common sense and common decency prevailed and men and women availed themselves of all opportunities. New roads were laid, office blocks shut up, and luxury flats stood on crumbling slums, like shining false teeth on rotten gums. I'll stop there. What's cheap? That's wonderful. Uh, your writing is so strong and evocative. Um, and I wanted to just start the conversation by asking, um, you know, how do you, how do you approach point of view when you write? Because I know that, you know, the voice in Elmet and the voice in Hot Stew is very different and you occupy, um, I, I, I lost count of how many kind of points of view you enter in this book, um, but they all, you know, but we, we start with this kind of omniscient narration um, that allows us to, you know, that, that snail gives us this movement into this place and we find out all this history. And so I just, I, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, did you start in a particular point of view and, uh, and how did you know, when, when did that all kind of fall into place? Like, how did you approach that part of the structure? Um, so, yeah, so El Elmer is, uh, yeah, it's, it's in first person, but it's it's got a very, very different voice from Hot Stew because it's it's written very much in the voice of, of that character um, that I was, I was, I was thinking about and inhabiting um, during that process. And Hot Stew, as you say, is, is totally different. It's, um, yeah, there are, there are many different points of view. It's, it's third person. It begins with this kind of distant, distant narrator um, who gives you a kind of 
a span across history um, and as you say this kind of <laughs> the figure of the snail um, and then as I as I was writing I think the voice came quite slowly because I was really I was writing I was writing lots of the different characters at the same time and uh, I, yeah there were there are a number of point of I guess you'd maybe call the point of view characters or sort of more more central characters and then then over 20 kind of other characters who do who do figure um, and I was re- writing them all um, with a with a similar kind of waiting um, and then I was it was it was during the process that that some of the more central some of the more central characters emerged and that that happened as I was as I was writing and, and as I was um, kind of nego- you know allowing these characters to negotiate their space and um to to sort of go through the story um and yeah in the writing process in the editing process <laughs> those characters kind of those those voices kind of um sort of either either came to the fore or diminished i'm curious what the uh, first thing you wrote in this book was oh gosh uh, i think it was from the second chapter um so it's the bit where they're they're all going into the the pub. So a lot of the so this is set in they set in Soho in central London, and all of these characters kind of inhabit that space in various ways. And um, the pub is this, this kind of old old fashioned uh, English London pub, and um, that's the space that a lot of them a lot of them inhabit. So I think the first, yeah, the first chapter was was the the pub scene, which is now now chapter two. So there's kind of a lot of a lot of the different characters colliding. Um, these two characters who kind of perform magic tricks to, for tips. They kind of come in and they meet meet other characters, and there's there's a sort of minor altercation. So that was yeah, that was the the very first um, you know very first thing that I I wrote on on paper that was actually um put pen to paper and that was that was the scene that I wrote um and I wrote yeah it was it was much longer in its <laughs> its original iteration but that, that was you the started in the in the thick of it you started with all these characters coming together was there was there was there a, a, was there one guiding character at any point who like gave you kind of the anchor that you needed or or were you pretty comfortable from the beginning writing this whole cast uh and uh, it, it's interesting to me because that's that's always been hard for me to have more than like more, having more than like four characters in a scene is always like a, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think having lots of characters in scenes is sorry say again oh no I, I feel like I always have to hold on to like one character like they're my the one person I know at a party you know yeah <laughs> um I think it's I think it's yeah I think that's the only time that I have lots and lots of characters in one scene, or maybe there are a few occasions I have them in one scene, because I, I agree there's, you kind of, you often get more out of them by sort of um, having them speaking to one other person or kind of going going in and out of a room and, and having more of a one-on-one sort of set up. Um, but yeah, I really did, I really did start with, with a lot, a lot of characters and, and I kind of, um, in a way, I kind of took that as a, as a place of, of safety in a way you know I was sort of I'd be writing one character and I'd get a little bit stuck and then I'd be able to just move uh, move into another character and um, figure out what they were doing and and as I say you know because I because I was um, I was spreading my bets with the characters um, and found that some of them were working and some of them weren't working um, I was actually yeah I was I was able to kind of hone in on the ones that 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 would that, that felt felt right, I suppose, and I had all the I had a lot of others that were kind of um, percolating. So yeah, for me, it, for me, it was actually a place of safety to <laughs> to do it that way. Um, but yeah, there there were a few occasions on which on which you know these characters really sort of um, get together, and there are these sort of set pieces, I suppose, um, quite uh, quite stagey in a way. Um, I, I did kind of envisage a lot of this as. As, as being quite theatrical it's so so who's the as I sort of touched upon in in the opening it's the kind of historic uh th- theatre district of London and has been for quite a while um it's sort of party district theatre district um and so it's where all it's where the West End is where all the all the plays are so it was always in my mind to have these kind of theatrical characters and to have you know even sort of 
plays within plays and and kind of riffing on that so so yeah I, I always imagine there to be this big cast and people just popping in and popping out um and I yeah for, for me it was kind of it it, it felt kind of you know um it felt like a good a good way to write it um yeah it has that um the the building that is the focal point of this kind of battle for the heart of the heart of the neighborhood you know that feels like this grand set you know like you know like the kind of um the victorian mansion novel that is where there's the upstairs and the downstairs i feel like downton abbey has really introduced a lot of americans to that that concept and that mode of storytelling but you know you have this building where there's there's the upstairs even up to the rooftop uh, you know, and there's the there's the ground floor, there's the there's the underground, you know, and you have different people um, and the kind of intersections between these separate casts and the way that they come together. I mean, that is the hot stew. I, I found that really compelling um, and es- and also es- especially laid in with that feeling of history and, you know, just these layers and layers of people and time. Um, did you did you have a favorite character or actually these are two separate questions. Do you have a favorite character in this cast and uh, which was the easiest or most fun to write? Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I, I suppose I, 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 I like Lorenzo quite a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he seems like the kind of person that I would, I would personally be friends with or personally, you know, personally, personally meet and hang out with. Um, so he, yeah, he's, he's an actor and he's lived in the neighborhood his whole life. Um, his, yeah, his, his mom and his aunt worked in Italian restaurants, um, of which they were, they used to be loads in Soho. Um, and yeah, so he, he, he's grown up in the neighborhood, um, in, in a council flat and he's seen, he's seen it change and he's living there now and he's, yeah, he's working as an actor and kind of finding, um, find, finding it a little bit challenging and sort of <laughs> finding kind of his, his moral position um, in certain sort of his uh, jobs kind of challenging and, and he spends his time kind of kind of yeah questioning what he's what he's doing with, with his art and um, what art means you know what art means in the kind of the wider context of what, what's going on in the world. So um, yeah, I, I like Lorenzo a lot. Um, and was the second question, who did I find easy to write or when yeah. yeah. Um Yeah. Well, I, re- <laughs> I really enjoyed writing uh, the Debbie McGee character. She she has this mm-hmm. kind of, um, so she lives in the basement and um, she, yes, she's got this kind of accomplice who's sort of her, sort of her partner, but it's not, it's not a very, it's not a healthy relationship. Um, and she has this kind of surreal trajectory. She kind of takes us into this, you know, it touches upon the kind of a magical element. Um, and she was really, really fun because, because of the surreal quality of it. You know, she kind of, yeah, she sort of goes around the neighborhood um, performing these magic tricks. And then um, she's, she's as part of this sort of um, quasi, quasi cult. Um, and she kind of finds this uh, building site with this hole, which goes takes her down into the depths of the city. So she kind of she goes underground. Um, she walks in the in the tunnels beneath London, um, you know, the underground, and she finds all these other other tunnels. And then one thing leads to another, and she she finds herself in this kind of quite um, quite luxurious basement, which is sort of um, yeah, it, it's kind of kind of meant to be surreal, but it, might also touch upon some of the the basements owned by um you know some of these um yeah very very wealthy people in london um yeah yeah the 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 bunkers (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) um lorenzo's you know he becomes involved in this tv show that has you know, I mean, I, I read it and I was like, oh, this feels Game of thrones uh, And and he, uh, and that that is kind of what you're talking about, a sort of play within the play uh, that mm-hmm. that provides some commentary on the book itself and what's mm-hmm. going on in their lives. Um, mm-hmm. Because um, one of his moral quandaries has to do with how, how, uh, how sex work is represented and also how he, how he, cause I think he's, he's an actor of color, right? Or he's a queer actor. Um, yeah, he's queer, and and his his dad's from Sri Lanka. 
Same. Yeah, and so he has some qualms about how you know he's situated in this story about sex right. work, um, and um, and you know some of the main cast of this of this novel is made up of this floor of sex workers that have who have created this safe brothel on an upper floor of this building that is under threat of um, being torn down. Um, and you know, I've always I, I, I've always been interested in portrayals of sex work because I think it's it's such a it's such a sensitive topic. I think that people approach it in um, in a lot of ways, some of which are you know kind of voyeuristic and lurid, and some and you know and 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 sometimes you get a really thoughtful piece. And I I, I thought that your your book fit into into that category. Um, and I was really interested too in like the way that the brothel was set up, you know, the kind of the kind of rules of um, Precious's and Tabitha's relationship, um, and you know the 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 particular um, space that they occupy, like the physical space, um, was really well drawn. Um, and so I I, I want to ask, um, you know, how you approached that topic. Um, you know, was that one where there was a lot of research involved? Um, you know, and, and I'm also curious if this uh, fight for this Soho building was based on, um, it w had any kind of corollary in, in um, you know, because I'm at, because Soho is a gentr, you know, that's a neighborhood that has, in, that has these gentrification battles, and, and so I'm wondering if there was like a, a um, real life building um, that kind of maybe corresponded to some of these these struggles. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, so, so yeah. I mean, Soho is is um, yeah known, known for theatres, restaurants, bars, parties, um, music, film, um, and it's also known known for sex work. So. Um, there, there's yeah so in in 2013 there was a kind of um, an attempted clear out of some of what are, what are known as the war cups um mm. in soho so and there was a kind of collective action um by many of the women um kind of to to stop to stop that eviction and the kind of the, the the reasoning that was given by the metropolitan police um was kind of about sort of yeah, the, the safety of women, kind of other women. It wasn't wasn't clear that it was sort of the safety of of you know the women in the buildings themselves, but it's kind of sort of other women around the neighbourhood and kind of general general concerns of that nature. Um, but there was a lot of suspicion at the time that that what was really going on was kind of much more about about money and land, um, and that <laughs> that the de developers wanted to make. To make money from the building and it wasn't wasn't really anything to do with um the kind of the the, the purported motives of, of the police you know that's that's obviously up, up for debate so that was something that that was going on um this is a kind of just entirely entirely fictionalized kind of take on that um it's not it's not really kind of pinned to any any one thing and the outcome you know the outcome in in the novel is very different and much more much more kind of yeah sort of much more surreal and um uh and yeah those women did kind of win their campaign and they they were sort of reinstated so yeah there was there were definitely kind of currents of that um that were kind of were sort of in the air and in my mind and was being written about um and as for the kind of portrayal of of um, you know those characters, Precious and, and Tabitha, and the others. Um, my my guiding principle was that it, it's primarily a novel about about kind of community and conflict and and money and land and and gentrification and 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 places that we call home. And for that reason, I kind of wanted their work to just or what they do to make money, um, what they do for a living to be kind of pushed into the background but I was obviously aware that, <laughs> that it, you know it was it's such a kind of contentious uh, topic that it was it was always going to be there to be ne needing to be addressed in some way mm -hmm. and that it was important to kind of you know just dis discuss this setup that these women had while also mentioning that for many many um women who sell sex you know that they there's a lot of poverty. There's there are there are a lot of bad conditions, and that 
the, the situation that Precious and Tabitha are currently in is kind of, um, you know, a very sort of uh, discreet example. Um, so I wanted to kind of, kind of do that and I wanted to, to make sure I wasn't, I, I wasn't doing that kind of titillating thing. But I also wanted to kind of draw in some questions about, um, you know, how these how these things are represented in the media and, and what that does for people's perceptions of sex work. So um, that's why I'd had this had this kind of play within a play where where Lorenzo was, you know, I didn't want to show any, I didn't want to show sort of Tabitha and and Precious really having sex at all or doing their work because their relationship is much more about sort of um, fighting their landlord you know, cooking, having fun with each other and living their lives. Um, so I wanted to kind of do do the kind of sex work stuff within the kind of the neat space of the, the play within a play. Um, and yeah, so L Lorenzo finds himself kind of acting the part of this sort of <laughs> this pimp and he, um, but he's kind of being told to play it as this sort of happy, fun, happy fun pimp and he's just he's not really sure he's not really sure what he's what he's doing and what he's supposed to be what he's supposed to be presenting and and you know his character becomes very violent with the women and he's kind of he, he finds himself you know doing doing the job of the actor which is which is to play the part but also just feeling this kind of wretchedness about about having this job which essentially involves him you know um beating up being up women while, <laughs> while you know being, being filmed filmed doing it and paid so he's kind of he's he's kind of conflicted in that regard yeah and then his uh drinking buddy robert is uh you know is a real life you know kind of retiredish enforcer mm. uh mm. who is very quiet about his past and he mm. has done much more questionable things uh, for work. Um, can you, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to hear uh, you talk about uh, Robert and Agatha. Agatha was such an interesting character to me. She, she's such a cold customer, and she's kind of the, she's kind of the villain. You know, she she plays the role of the villain of the story. She's the one who is, you know, she's the she's a, she's a multimillionaire, and she wants she wants to develop these condos. She's also young, and she she's I think she's in her twenties, right? And she has this kind of interesting family background um uh so can, can, can you talk about where these two came from and they're sort and they're sort of connected to each other yeah, too yeah. um yeah so uh, so agatha has inherited um her fortune from her father who was a kind of um notorious n notorious gangster london gangster in the area and he's a kind of i guess a kind of amalgamation like, you know again a, a sort of an amalgamation of lots of different kind of figures from from the 1960s in, in London, you know, a um, lot, of, lot of gangsters from that period. And um, so she's she's extremely wealthy, but she has never been involved directly in crime herself. And, you know, she went to she went to good schools. She moves in very rarefied circles. You know, she dresses well. She's sophisticated. She she is herself entirely gentrified and she's wanting to distance herself from from her past, you know, her, her father got this got this huge fortune and all of you know a lot of the property in the area by nefarious means, by um, you know, through extortion and, and pimping and and drug dealing, all, all sorts of things. And she um, she wants the money, but she doesn't want the <laughs> she doesn't want anything to do with where it came from. Um, and she's really, really um, terrified, paranoid, actually, about about losing that money and about kind of returning to this this state of poverty, which is where um, both sides of her family originally came from. So um, she's doing what she can to to distance herself from the old Soho, which means kind of clearing out this building and, and turning it into luxury flats and and you know washing her hands of the place. Um, and yeah, she is she is a cold customer. Um, she has this kind of, um, but I think it, I think a lot of it, you know, I wanted to present a lot of it as coming through through fear, you know, this this fear of um, fear of losing her money. She has this kind of almost obsessive uh, interest in the French Revolution. Yeah. Because she's got this this eye, and she collects souvenirs from the guillotine, you know, antiques, um, you know, uh, knack. Uh, what am I trying to say? Handkerchiefs <laughs> that were <laughs> um, at the guillotine, 
And, and the reason she's so obsessed with it is because she's just terrified that that's going to happen in London and she keeps a, a yacht moored on the Thames um, in order to in order to escape should, should that ever occur, if there's ever, ever kind of full-scale full revolution uh, in, in the United Kingdom. So she's kind of, yeah, in, in full-on panic about, about how much money she has and, and wanting to keep it. Um, yeah, and, and of course... <laughs> It's kind of kind of weird because so her, her other the other side of her, her family, um, you know, her, her mother was from Russia and, and moved to London after the, the fall of the Soviet Union. And um, so she has kind of slight connections in, in the kind of the world of the very, very rich people who have moved their, their money to London, which we are currently uh, hearing a lot about. Um, about yeah, as I was yeah, yeah, because London, you know, London's a sort of major uh, city of, of money laundering, and it's um, and you know, huge numbers of London's professional classes are completely complicit, and it's disgusting. Um, so yeah, so she's kind of in that world, and she's got her she's got her yacht um, yacht ready to go should she need to. Yeah, and Robert, uh, yeah, so Robert Robert's this kind of um, this old enforcer who is who is also in that world, um, though not kind of making the same kind of money um and yeah he has a very very shady past i want with with robert i wanted to i wanted to kind of open up the question of redemption mm -hmm. and whether there are some places that a person can go to with their life which are irredeemable and it's not a question i wanted to answer in, in the book it's a question i wanted to open up so i tried to think think of some of the kind of um you know, I, I I try to kind of present this figure with this this really quite dark past, but then also kind of show where he is now and what he's trying to be, and and this this idea that he at least wants to kind of better himself. And um, yeah, I, I I don't you know he has this this friendship with Lorenzo, and it's kind of left open as to whether after Lorenzo finds out who he is, whether he could ever forgive him. And and I I guess that, that's a that's a question for the reader because it's it's not a question that I think I can answer. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, these are. I, I I think I think what's interesting about that character is just this idea that you know you do things that define who you are. Uh, you know, probably for the rest of your life, and then you still have to live the rest of your life. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think um, we're used to reading stories about people in particular moments. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, he's passed like a lot that that uh, a complete he's completely passed that chapter. And yet um, it's so it, it's 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 he's a he's a interesting character to live with um, because your sympathies are with the person who he is now. You know, but uh, and then you find out more and more, um, you know, about the things that he's done in the same way that Lorenzo does. Um, I so in both in both your novels, you know, the. Um, there's this contention over property and um, and you know just freedom to live where you live, um, and in both cases, you know this is this is uh, um, this is a question that leads very quickly to violence, um, and and in and in a way that almost feels necessary, you know and um, and for those of you who uh, I, I I think I forgot to introduce myself, but I, I I'm a crime writer. I write about. Mm -hmm. I write about crime in Los Angeles, you know, and 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 what interests me about crime stories is this proximity of, you know, desperation to, you know, just crossing that fence into violence, yeah. into that into into this realm where anything can happen, um, you know. And Agatha, in a lot of ways, has the law on her side, even though even though she has a history that is riddled with lawbreaking um, and violence and deceit. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to ask you about that, um, about kind of, um, cause I mean, I, I call myself a crime writer. I don't, I, 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 I wouldn't really classify your books as crime fiction, but they are in that middle ground that I particularly tr treasure. Like I love books that delve into this territory, um, of, uh, you know, the way that, the, the way that crime kind of appears in um in these tense situations uh, where you get a lot of people together in these hot stews um and so i want I, I want to ask you um about your approach to um to writing about crime and violence and if you think that you will keep writing um stories that fall into this um you know into this sort of genre adjacent space where you're talking about 
um, the these kind of really dark th evil things that people do to each other. Yeah, so I suppose one of the things I was interested in when I was writing a hot stew particularly was was how how much uh, firstly how much time must pass and secondly how much how much money has to be made before a crime becomes respectable mm. so that's exactly what's going on with with Agatha um you know enough uh, in in the in the eyes of the law and the law is very much on her side um enough time has passed and and enough money has been made and enough money has has changed hands into into the respectable world that um she's kind of allowed to escape from, from that and we also have other characters who um come from these you know so i'm thinking of bastian um and bastian's father who's agatha's lawyer so they they come from um a really really old english family kind of like the sort of downtown abbey setup that that you you uh, were speaking of um and so they've never had to worry about not being respectable you know they've never <laughs> they've never had to worry about anything and i kind of wanted to offer this contrast between sort of between them and agatha because they've they've had this sort of money for generations and generations and generations but what we know about history is that at some point down the line you know if you go if you go really far back it's it's likely come through violence um you know so you know his is a family that's that's connected to families that are around during you know sort of rape and pillage during the 15th century or something but it's still kind of it's it's still this idea of how much time passes and how much money is made to make it to make it respectable and so i, I suppose i was trying to tie those stitch those things together and kind of uh, <laughs> try to try to work that out and, it, and of course it applies to Robert as well you know how much time would need to pass for him to for, for, for him to, to find redemption would it ever be possible you know uh, maybe not um so yeah I, I I suppose I was kind of I was interested in the kind of the trajectory of of those crimes and the, tra the trajectory of violence and and the way that it kind of you know um it affects multiple generations, um, and and as for as for sort of, you know, my approach going forward, I I, I don't know. I mean, you, you're absolutely right. Both you know, both my books have been about land, and they've both contained kind of elements of violence. I mean, Elmer was was quite violent. Hot Stew has kind of violence and comedy in a kind of sort of over the top sort of theatrical way. Um, and I, it, part of me kind of wants to <laughs> wants to get away from violence because I do sort of <laughs> I do kind of have this this, this idea that um, I don't know may, maybe we I, th I think I think um, I think cultures need need sort of different things at different moments from from their art and and I sort of feel like um, we may be moving to a place where we don't need we don't need our our literature to be quite so violent, but I mean that's just something I'm I'm toying with. I don't know. I don't know. But I, but whenever, <laughs> unfortunately, whenever I write, you know, I think I'm writing about something kind of, um, you know, sort of every day or something about kind of human relationships, and then some character will have, you know, the most sort of dreadful memory of. Of, of violence, or, or some, or you know, some sort of dreadful fantasy about doing doing something horrible to someone. Um, I don't know why this is, um, I, I, it's, but but it's it's something which kind of um, I continue to explore. I suppose. I mean, I, I suppose you know the the books that I've I've loved reading have always had these kind of elements, um, and um, yeah, I suppose it's kind of it's kind of natural that it would it would come out in that way. Um, I mean, violence and crime, they up the stakes, you know, they put your characters through, uh, through a yeah. microscope that, uh, I think, uh, I, th I think they other there, cause you know, I think, um, people kind of get a pass if they don't have to go through particularly yeah. extreme circumstances. And I think, uh, you know, the situations that you, you often put your characters in, they don't get to just quietly be themselves, yeah. but, you know, it kind of starts coming out. 
Um, I mean, that's one of the things that appeals to me about, I mean, yeah. I don't really write violent novels, but I think that just the, the, um, that kind of uncertainty, that teeter tottering between the, the straight world and what, yeah. what, right underneath and and uh you know not really quite in the past mm -hmm. um you know what you're saying about um you know the, the amount of time that it takes for a crime to be respectable i mean that's something that i think about a lot as an american and i think that maybe you know living in any country with a history of imperialism or colonialism yeah. or slavery you know that's just something you you run up against you know at what point is um at what point are we far enough away to let it all go yeah. um i think that's the kind of I mean, that's the central political question of like any of these, a, any of these battles between uh, the far right and and uh, the left, right? Um, yeah. yeah, and and you know, I saw that you're a medievalist uh, yeah. by training. Um, you, you, you so you're you come from the academic world. Uh, yeah, I, so I was I was doing a PhD in uh, medieval history, yeah, and literature. Can so, you talk about? Um, how how your kind of forays into medievalism have uh, maybe affected affected your work and I mean I can definitely see it in like your view on your particular view on history um, but can you talk about that and also maybe how um, how you became interested in uh, writing fiction? Yeah, so um, one of the things which, which kind of really interest or drew me to the Middle Ages to to write about in an academic capacity was um, kind of <laughs> just <laughs> how kind of just how different it, it was from from today so um you know both my novels kind of cover contemporary issues so you know clearly I'm very interested in the contemporary but um there was just something wonderful about um how different every aspect of society was in the middle ages you know it was a kind of pre-industrial pre-capitalist um kind of space and there were there were sort of loads there was loads of to put it in a very sort of simple black and white way it was kind of there was loads of things that were really bad about the middle ages that were very different from what we have now but there were lots of things about the middle ages which were kind of really wonderful and interesting um and they had you know such such different ideas this is speaking very very generally they had such different ideas about about communities and about kind of um, organizing communities for better or worse um so i was really yeah in, interested in that always, always interested in in thinking about different ways in which society is organized um and also the the literature is so so kind of extraordinary extraordinarily weird um in, in in so many ways so i guess people who maybe don't sort of you know art specialists or who maybe kind of did a couple of medieval texts um at college you know might know might know Chaucer or things like that um but there's this whole wealth of literature which is which is just kind of fantastical and bizarre and is asking these kind of you know very very deep questions about humanity through sort of these often fantastical tales of um you know, nights on intrepid journeys through through kind of mystical wildernesses. So <laughs> um, I, that's what appealed to me about it, and and I think it has sort of seeped into um, into my contemporary writing. I mean, certainly Elmer kind of touched upon the medieval and, and the folkloric, um, the the idea of sort of going to the forest to ask questions um or to or to, to find a kind of space that you, you can't find elsewhere is certainly a, um you know a, a medieval uh, european motif um and um and yeah and certainly with with hot stew um i did a lot of i did a lot of work on um the sort of kind of disputes within <laughs> within medieval london and there were loads and loads of land disputes and it was really interesting and there were also um instances um of the kind of civic government um, really explicitly just um, evicting um, ev evicting sex workers, evicting women that they suspected of living immodestly in order to redevelop the area. So it was kind of, there were sort of parallels in what I was doing in my in my academic research in the Middle Ages and, and sort of what was going on around the 2013 time in, in Soho. So all of those things kind of got stitched together, yeah. 
Um, I, I, I want, it's been about 45 minutes. So I just wanted to say if, if people do have questions, you can feel free to type them and, uh, we'll, get, we'll get to them. Um, but I, but, um, in the meantime, I, I have a few more questions for you. Um, so, uh, are you, did you finish the PhD? Are you, are you still working on it? Or no, just... I, didn't, I didn't finish the PhD. Just went, I went in a different direction. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. So how did you get started on writing writing fiction anyway? Like uh... so I was I was doing it at the same time as my PhD. Um, so well, actually, I started it when I was living in London. So I I started Elmet. Um, I was I was living in London, in fact, for a little bit for four months. I lived in Soho, right in central London, um, when a lot of these disputes were taking place. In fact, and so that's when I started writing Elmet, which is set in Yorkshire, which is part of the north of England that I'm from. So I was kind of in London writing about Yorkshire and then I, I started my um, master's degree, my PhD, and I, and that was in in York in the north of England. And when I was there, I started writing Hot Stew. So yeah, Elmet came first and um, and then I already started writing Hot Stew by the time Elmet, Elmet got published. Um, but when Elmet got published, it, it kind of, um, it, it, it took off in quite a big way in, in the UK. Mm. Um, and then was you know it did much better than I had anticipated. So, um, and I wanted to kind of take all of the, the sort of new opportunities that were available. So I, I kind of went in that in that direction of the PhD. Yeah. And uh, you know when when you so you started writing. Um, you see, you started started writing pretty young. Um, ha, what is so? Are you do you write full time now? Uh, yeah. Um, Pretty much, pretty much. What I mean, I do various kinds of writing. But yeah, yeah I, I know, I did. I, I know that. I know the deal. Um, I'm also a full-time writer. So, yeah. um, do you, so what's your uh, what's your like process like? Like, what does like a day of writing look like for you? And I, and I'm also curious. Um, are you working on another book right now, or what are you working on? Yeah, um, yeah, I am. I'm working on a few different things at the moment, which is not something I've ever let myself do before mm -hmm. because I'm, I've been very, very kind of strict with just working on one thing at a time. So I got to the end of Element and then I immediately started Hot Stew because I, the ideas were already percolated, but I wouldn't allow myself to start. Um, but at the moment, I'm working on a few different things. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I am working on a novel um, and I'm also kind of, yeah, still toying with some some non-fiction that kind of relates to relates to my phd and um yeah i'm actually also writing a play um and we'll see how that goes so, yeah oh. writing, <laughs> writing various things do you write anything set in uh in in medieval times no i <laughs> so far kind of stayed away from that i guess i it would be the obvious thing to do but um i don't know i su i suppose i just i I, I had these kind of stories that I wanted to write, which were very com contemporary. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if at some point I write something about a land dispute in medieval London. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but it's not something I've, I've been wanting to do at the moment, just because, um, yeah, I'm, with, with my fiction at least, I'm interested in exploring the contemporary. Um, at the moment and so the, the the thing I'm currently working on is is also contemporary so yeah kind of um, using using kind of my academic background for inspiration but but the topics are in the here and now yeah I can imagine um, just uh, the uh, just from the texture and the sounds that you, you know the kind of sizzle of hot stew um, you know that's that would be harder to do if uh, you didn't have access to the actual time and place <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Um, it doesn't look like we had any questions this time, but I do have a question that I always like to ask authors. Um, and I feel like maybe Steph asked this of you uh, when we were in the little green room, but is there something that you wish people would ask you about when you talk about this book or any of your work in particular? Um, no, <laughs> no, there isn't. <laughs> you feel like you feel like it's all been covered. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. Happy to answer whatever questions people have, really. Um, but no. I... <laughs> um, and is there anything you want to say before we sign off for the night? I really like. 
uh, we at the bookshop really appreciate your time and please go ahead, use this platform and the eventual YouTube audience that we have, because we upload these onto YouTube after the fact. Um, but please go ahead and use that for anything you might want to promote. Um, if you are the self-promotion type, I know some people aren't. I'm definitely not, but I, I'm trying. I, yeah, I, 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 I see that it would be good for, good for me to be better at that. So I will, I will try. It is not something that most authors are uh, pleased to have to do. <laughs> Well, I, I really love, um, I, I, I always really, really love meeting people and going out and doing doing events, going to bookshops, all all of that self-promotion stuff I'm really, 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 really happy with. But um, yeah, bragging on social media, I, I feel less yeah. happy with that. But it's also, it's, it's kind of a necessary part of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well... I will just say, I think Hot Stew is a fantastic book and I would highly recommend um, that you guys buy it, if not just because. Uh, I really like seeing when my staff picks get um, get bought. I feel like I'm winning some sort of taste competition. <laughs> um, but other than that, yeah. Uh, Steph, do you have anything you wanna say before you sign off? Um, I just want to say thank you for uh, thank you for having us. Uh, it was really nice to you know, it was really nice to meet uh, meet you, Fiona. Um, and and uh, I'm really looking forward to um, whatever we have coming up next. Um, I'll definitely read it. Um, and uh, you know, I hope everyone else does too. All right. Have a good night, everyone. And as always, you can find us at astoriabookshop.com or just click that little button down below. All right. <laughs> good night.